<laughs> All right, let's just do it. Okay. Fuck it, we're doing it live. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. What y'all doing there now today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're coming in hot. We are, yeah. I'm looking forward to this story today. You are? I am. Really? really? Forward, yeah. I like these old times. Oh, by the way, I'm Mike and this is Keith. Oh, yeah. Hi, sorry, <laughs> we're like yeah. 10 minutes in. Oh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't this even just we mention it. That's how we just don't even introduce ourselves to now. <laughs> just straight in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the way to do it, man. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. It's a, I like these old timey crimey ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I was getting into it. So before we get into the actual story today, I came across another uh, mystery. You which, did? Which I think you might enjoy. It's okay. A little, it's, it's, it's a bit short, but All right, I think this is a mystery. It. I have no... Uh, this is fresh for me, folks. Okay, I'm locked in. Okay. Have you ever heard of the Kentucky meat shower? Is that when random meat fell from the sky? Yes, we have. Okay, heard. let's move on. <laughs> I, I know the story. <laughs> <laughs> no, Keith, no, you can stop talking right now. No, okay. Keith, keep going. It was like a random like bits of meat or some shit fell from the sky or something. Yeah, so let me take you back to the year... 1876. So mm. the Kentucky meat shower was an incident occurring for a period of several minutes between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. on March 3rd, where chunks of red meat just fell from the sky in a 90 to 45 meter area. Wow. The event was witnessed by one farm wife whose yard was scattered with chunks of flesh described as to fill a horse wagon full. Wow, it's a lot of meat. I assume so. I don't know what a horse wagon. I assume it's quite big. I presume it's. I mean, yeah. What, yeah. what kind of meat was it? Well, that's the thing. So, at the time uh, of the meat rain, yeah. locals they were puzzled uh, about what could have caused it, and to try and determine what kind of meat it was, uh, they, they had some edit. guesses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, some people tried it, and the uh, guesses they range from mutton to bear meat. Uh, some who were brave enough to eat it, they said it might have been deer or bear or horse or possibly human. Wow, but definitely not chicken. Uh, no, I think you know. Just go chicken. to yeah, yeah. Well, it's a dark meat, obviously. Yeah, it's like red yeah, meat. Yeah, yeah. Dark wow. meat. No idea what it was. Maybe, little... Was it delicious? Uh, Can we get some more of them? Well, n- nobody said it was delicious. Uh, I think they just tried it. I don't think they made it into like a meal. Uh, they just like picked it up <laughs> off the ground and started gnawing on it. Mm. Basting it in butter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throwing a bit of thyme, thyme and yeah. shit on their lemons or whatever. A bit of garlic cloves. Yeah. Delicious. Oh, by the way, for the focus, I don't think they know that about Keith. Mm. He's a real foodie. I do like food. Keith yeah. is a very good cook. Uh, you are, actually. We used to have our little dinner dates. We did, uh, yeah. When our wives weren't around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, Keith's a very good cook. He loves, you're always mad trying new food and recipes and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny because I always try new food at home where, like, you know me, like, when I'm out and about, I just right. always just go to... Yeah, you're a terrible eater, like, when it comes to eating it. I am. You're yeah, like... I, I just go uh, to what I know. Basic bread, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought we went to this really nice... Yeah, about, what, a month ago, we went out for dinner. This lovely Japanese restaurant. And all before, you were like, yeah, I'm going to try that thing. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as we got there... The classic curry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was like, the thing what you always mean? get. A chicken. <laughs> chicken classic curry, Chicken please. and rice, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, all right. And then you you had all like the nice uh, what, pear wines and stuff and I was like uh, uh, Heineken <laughs> yeah. bottle of Heineken please what did even that I think that was exotic it was just like a uh, ramen freaking pork ramen was it wasn't like, even that like strange or weird or I know it, well it was a lot yeah. more exotic than my chicken curry yeah. my basic bitch chicken yeah. curry <laughs> <laughs> which was delicious by the way yeah I'm sure it was well I'm a, uh, I knew I'm it a, would be that's why <laughs> yeah well yeah, hey listen you always gotta go to classics you that's know true. never be disappointed exactly you know stay in your lane that's it man that's it aim low and never be disappointed that's yeah. exactly that's it that's it well hey listen speaking of aiming low and never being disappointed uh, that's kind of what this guy in this video or this fucking hell I'm so used to talking about videos that's what this guy in this story kind of did. Otto yeah. Sanhuber, Huber, the Batman, mm. uh, the ghost in the garret. Yeah. Uh, he aimed low and he was never disappointed. That's true. Yeah, that's a good segue in, man. Good Thank segue. you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm trying to, I'm working on my segues. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's let the listeners decide. If you <laughs> like that segue, let me know. And if you didn't like it, I don't care. Keep it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to set the scene on a hot summer evening. August 22nd, 1922, if you can believe that. August 22nd, 1922. What do you think happened that day, Keith, in history? Not not this story. Something else. Um, it was not the day the Ice Age ended. No. I know that's what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was spring. What, what date was that? That was... Uh, I can't remember. Anything. August 22nd, 1922. Uh, I don't know. What happened? Benito Mussolini marched on Rome. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, I can't believe I forgot that. I know, I know. <laughs> Dumbass. So, so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so that day, Dolly and Fred Osterreich. I'm not going to say it that way every time, by the way. I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of yeah. their name. They got back to their home. 
their home was located at 858 North Andrews Boulevard in the City of Angels, mm. L.A., they call it. <laughs> Uh, they got home after a night of partying with friends. And this was 1922 partying. You know, you got like Gatsby partying. Mm, yeah, She's yeah, probably, yeah. what were those, those things called? The women dress, the style for women back in the 20s. What's that called? The, the roaring 20s. It was, um, what's that called? The, it was like, a lot of frilly stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. they had the short hair. Yes. Uh, what's that style called? 1922. This is called the 1920s style. No, it had a name for it. Uh, People are like screaming at the moment. Yeah, I know. Flappers. That's flappers. What it is. Flappers. Yeah, yeah. So they look kind of cool. And so, Fred, Dolly, they're out there drinking cocktails at the bars where everything was Art Deco, very noir LA style. And then they got home this night to their house. However, upon entering the door, suddenly, Fred found himself staring down a ghost from his past in their living room. Only this ghost was aiming two guns square at him. Very nice, by the way. Dual action. That's mm, pretty cool. That's it, yeah. When one just won't cut it. Exactly. You gotta have two. Why have one gun when you can have two? That's what I say. You gotta have backup. Why not three? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen. <laughs> Go with four. Keep going. Come on. How high can we take this? So why this ghost with two guns was there, why he was aiming the guns at them, and what happened next uncovered one of the most bizarre and unbelievable stories you could imagine. So buckle up, buckaroos. This, this is a wild story. This is a really yeah, wild story. It's re- yeah, this, this is very good. This is one when uh, Keith, by the way, fair fair play to you, did all the research for this one. So when I was reading through your research, this is definitely a story where I was like, holy shit. Like, I couldn't believe some of the shit that happens in the story. But you know what? Let's stop um, blowing our load and let's get into it. Okay. No more tangents. <laughs> no more tangents. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keith, uh, what's, your favorite type of, <laughs> what's your favorite type of frog? You know, that's, uh, that's my that's mic. It's got to be a bullfrog, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> This scandalous story kicks off in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a.k.a. Brew City. Hey, this, it's Miller time, am mm-hmm. I right? And it revolves around a particularly seductive homemaker known as Dolly. Good golly, it's Dolly. Born in 1880, Wahlberger, <laughs> Wahlberger, Dolly Korshelly. I would change my fucking name, too, if my name was Wahlberger. Yeah. Her parents hated her. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know where Dolly came from, because it was, just, it was Wahlberger. It was Wahlberger for ages, and then out and outwards, it was just done. Yeah, I mean, Wahlberger, yeah, yeah, woof. I mean, I don't think there's any kind of, like, way you can kind of cutify yeah, yeah. Wahlberger. Wally. Wall. That's it. I mean, for a woman, that's not a good name. No, a man could probably get away with Wally. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Wally. Yeah, Walter, like yeah. Wally. Wally. Woman, it's not great. Burger? Come that's on. even worse. So she, Dolly, <laughs> uh, Dolly was a German immigrant who grew up in uh, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. And this part of America back then, like it is today, it's uh, surrounded by a community of fellow German immigrants. It's a very heavily uh, German part of America. Um, and in her early 20s, she tied the knot with Fred Ostreich, another German immigrant who happened to be the affluent owner of a thriving apron factory. Something, a fact which I'm sure did not slip by our Dolly's uh, attention. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See, funnily enough, by the way, Fred, German immigrant, his surname Ostreich means Austria. Oh. So which is it, Fred, you piece of <laughs> shit? <laughs> so the couple made their home in Milwaukee, but... The marriage between Fred and Dolly, it wasn't exactly a walk in the park. Fred was both a workaholic, yeah, I mean, he owned his own factory, and an alcoholic. Hey, listen, best of both worlds, if you ask me. (laughs) And Fred, he was often at work, and he left Dolly feeling lonely and, hey, hey, boys, sexually unfulfilled. Mm. Aprons came first before Dolly. (laughs) That's what happened, I guess. So, from the start of their marriage, rumors swirled about Dolly entertaining various lovers at home while Fred was busy at the mills. You see, Dolly, she had whew, an insatiable sexual appetite. She was uh, one for uh, deeds of the flesh, oh, you yes. might say. Oh, she was. And Fred didn't quite meet her needs in the bedroom. Now, newspapers would later, uh, years later, label her as a, quote, naughty vamp, which mm. I like that. Yeah, it's good. And also comely. Uh, is that a compliment, comely? Oh, we read it's comely. That's Comely? It's probably not that, though. I mean, I, that sounds even worse. Yeah, but it fits. Okay, <laughs> that's true. Very true. 
The LA Times even commented uh, her eyes and her appetites would bring a long line of men into her life. So she, reading between lines, she was a hoo <laughs> <laughs> That sounds a bit harsh. Um, but you'll soon find out that Dolly is far from innocent in this man. The shit she gets up to. Oh yeah, it's okay. She, she's not a nice person. So. Yeah, exactly. So we can, we can such shame her all we want, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. It's fine. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I'll be the judge of this, by the way, of what people wrote about her. Have a have a Google. Uh, to the folks at home who are listening to this, uh, even if you're driving, have a quick Google on your phone. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, have a Google of Dolly Ostrike and just see what she looked like because, boy, <laughs> she busted. <laughs> you know, yeah, she is. Yeah. The standard of naughty vamp must have been pretty low <laughs> back in 1920, uh, whatever. She was. Yeah, like if, it was apparently like in her younger years, she was very. Because uh, she, she was. was even, I suppose in this picture. I mean, yeah, she looks like she's middle-aged in this picture, but, oh, boy, woof. Like, before she met Fred, she 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 had a lot of male attention, though. I mean, maybe there was just no Which women enjoyed. around. Either the standard for hotties back in the 20s was extremely low. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people lived to, like, nothing back then. Mm, they yeah. probably had, if you had two teeth, you were, like, the hottest chicken <laughs> town. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, enough about Dolly. Well, actually, let's talk some more about Dolly. So, Fred was at work all the time, uh, and so all the other fellows would go by, heavy Dolly, right. go get their little nuts sucked, whatever, having a good time. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with it. No, no. Just well, saying. She, well, she was married. Oh, yeah, okay, there is something wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. like, like, before all that, like, like, you do you, Dolly, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it, but she, she was married at this stage. Yeah, that's true. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is why it's always fun to do stories from 100 years ago, because you can really say what you want about these people, and uh, I'm not going to offend anybody. (laughs) So, one day, right, while Dolly was at the factory, a sewing machine broke down. This is when Dolly first laid eyes on 17-year-old Otto Sanhuber, or Sanhuber, the young repairman who worked for her husband. Now, it's thought he was of German-Jewish descent, and he had been adopted into the Sanhuber family, although his birth name was likely Weir. Dolly, who was in her 30s at this stage, was immediately attracted to the soft-spoken and shy boy. Mm. So Dolly and Fred, they did have a son called Raymond, but unfortunately he died in his early teenage years due to a... From what I read, it was like a lung illness. Mm. It wasn't too specific. I think back in the 20s. Yeah, just a lung illness. And Black lung. Yeah. Um, however, like some of uh, the materials I came across regarding this case suggested that she might have been initially drawn to Otto because he reminded her of her late son. Which is incredibly creepy. It is very creepy, but he was also, he was an orphan as well. So I think that's, I think he wanted to be muttered and she, she yeah, very weird. Yeah. Um, because like Otto, he wasn't a very handsome lad. So they reckon that she may have had these maternal feelings towards him uh, mixed in with grief, which then developed into an attraction. Uh, but yeah, I really hope that isn't the case because what they go on to do together is uh, that Todd is pretty sick. Yeah, the, that's that's gross. Uh, that's pretty gross. So I hope she, mm. yeah. <laughs> Swiftly moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1913, Dolly, pretending there was a problem with her sewing machine, asked Fred to send Otto over to the Ostrike stately home to make a repair. However, when Otto showed up, Dolly greeted him at the door wearing... Only a robe and stockings. Oui. She was in the nip. <laughs> Nothing but a smile. Very nice, yeah. <laughs> and so this was the beginning of Dolly and Otto's passionate affair, which would eventually end murderously. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Over the next three years, the factory boss lady and the handy repairman kept their little romance under wraps. Dolly would sneak off to Otto's boarding room sometimes and they'd splurge on a cozy hotel getaway. Otto often dropped by Dolly's place when she was sick or her hubby was off to another one of his late night lodge meetings. Otto once claimed that the two once made love no less than eight times in a single ecstasy filled night. Sounds like a lot of fun. I'm glad they were having a good time. And then you remember he was 17, being groomed if she was 33, who may have been into him because he looked like her son. Mm, yeah, messed up. Yeah. So things, uh, they couldn't keep chugging along as they were forever. A nosy neighbor uh, caught on to young Otto's frequent visits and, and eventually spilled the beans to Fred. Suspicious, Fred decided to have a chat with his wife, Dolly. But Dolly cool as a cucumber, spun a tale about a pesky book salesman bothering her, claiming she shut down his visits and he he wouldn't be a problem anymore. 
deli then thinking, how am I going to get Otto over nowadays with the freaking nosy pizza around? She hatched a genius plan. She, <laughs> fucking hell, uh, suggested Otto, hey, listen, I got a space for you right here, pal, move into the attic to avoid any further prying eyes. She sweetened the deal by mentioning free room and board for Otto. Plus, it meant he could be closer to his beloved Dolly all the time. Sure, uh, Otto had to give up his repair gig, but who cares? He had his own dreams. His own dreams of becoming a right whore. And so this arrangement would give him all the time in the world to hone his skills. Listen, stay up in the attic, write your little scribble, do your little scribbles, and then you come down and you bang Dolly. Yeah. Doesn't get much better than that, (laughs) right? Up in the attic, they spruced uh, things up a bit, tossed in an oil lamp, a cozy mattress, and even a pot to piss in. Otto also brought along some reading materials and basic writing supplies. So, during the day, Otto played Mr. Clean. He tackled all sorts of household chores like sweeping, dusting, dishwashing, veggie peeling, preparing stuff, you name it. Man about the house. When the Ostrikes hit the town or Fred was off doing his own thing, Otto could finally stretch his leg. You know, he could sneak out of his hideaway for some nighttime strolls, do whatever. And, and, and Dolly made sure to slap a padlock on the attic door, holding onto the key herself to make sure Fred didn't accidentally stumble up into the attic. So Otto was basically kind of a sex a slave, mm. a slave to Dolly, not just a sex slave, a slave in all ways. And he was just too young to kind of realize it. Yeah, yeah. he was like, this is a sweet deal. But I was like, no, no, it isn't. Yeah, a you're a mother. slave. You're yeah, Dolly's yeah. slave. You yeah, yeah. have to do all the shit around the house for during the day and then have sex or, yeah. or whatever. Like if you switch to genders around, you got some Joseph Fritzl yeah, exactly. type shit. Yeah. That's the point I was trying to get earlier. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We got there in the end. Hey. <laughs> Dolly, I guess she made it work. She must have been, uh, you know, she could she could do it all. Obviously for Otto, anyway, she was blowing his mind. <laughs> so when Fred did inquire about the lock on the attic, what's the, what's the story with that? She replied, just want to keep my furs safe, my dear. Dolly had her factory gig to tend to, so she wasn't home all the time. But she conveniently played the sick card now and then, giving her and Otto some quality time together. Yep, I know what you're thinking. I can see no disadvantages to this arrangement. However, there was a bit of a downside to this setup. Otto found himself living right above the woman he adored and her husband. So whenever the mood did strike Fred to have a roll in the hay with Dolly, Otto just had to do his best to you know, put the fingers in the ears and block out the noise. But, you know, hey, listen, must not have been that bad because Otto, he ended up staying in that attic for five. Not days, not weeks. He stayed up there for five years. Wild, isn't it? Yeah. Like, Otto, as we said earlier, he ended up this sex slave for Dolly. Uh, later, Otto, he described what an average day for him would be like. So now you mentioned some of this already, but from his words, he said, I made up the beds and changed the linen about two times a week. They love to sleep clean. And I made up the beds for them and put away their clothes and dusted Fred's clothes because he had some beautiful things. And I would keep them in order for him and dust them and dust his shoes, you know, so he would always look neat. And then, <laughs> Taking care of him, I guess. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Then I would wash the dishes if he wasn't home. And if he was home, he would wash them. And Dolly would, draw, well, actually, he said Mrs. Osterreich. So he'd always, he'd always uh, talk about her as, he never said Dolly anytime oh. he mentioned it. He, it was always Mrs. Osterreich. That kind of makes it kind of worse. She never stopped being this authoritative figure towards him. Yeah. They, were, they, were, they weren't on first name basis. Um, he also said he scrubbed the floor and kept it clean. He kept the floor neat, you know. She loved to have a beautiful floor and dusted it, you know. Um, so he, he also said that he would make a lot of dinners, which Fred would then enjoy. He was actually in the attic so long that when he went in, you could still legally buy alcohol in the United States. But when <laughs> prohibition kicked in, uh, one of Otto's new duties was to make a bathtub uh, full of gin for both himself and Dolly to stay lubricated for a <laughs> whole sex session. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, so they had him doing it all. So even though Otto San Huber was cooped up in the attic with only Dolly for company, in his mind, he, he escaped to his mind palace. He was <laughs> off on all sorts of wild adventures. And hey, he did not keep those fantasies to himself. He did follow his dream. Mm, Listen, live your dream, you yeah. know, sl- stay up in an attic, be yeah. a slave. And he spent most of his time, his free time, whatever little free time Dolly allowed him, when she didn't have chores for him and shit to do. Uh, Jesus, like he had a fucking wife or something. What? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> uh, he spent most of his free time writing Pulp Fiction stories. 
He would pass uh, these tales and short stories on to Dolly, who would type them up whenever Fred wasn't around, and then Dolly would send them off to these pulp magazines back in the day. Like any aspiring writer, Otto's first attempts were met with those dreaded rejection slips, but Otto was not one to give up easily. After all, sure what else would he be doing? Eventually, he did in fact manage to get some of his stories published under a pen name. Hmm. I wonder, do you think you can find them? Is it possible to find them? Are they still? I tried I try to find them. I think there was just so many short pulp stories. Right, It yeah, was yeah. hard to kind of say what Back was Back in the day, they're, yeah, yeah they're, yeah. Because I really wanted to read them. Yeah, I know. I wonder, all these stories are set in an attic for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you may be wondering how Fred remained completely oblivious to a man living in his attic for five entire years. Well, Fred, for one. He was a raging alcoholic, so we're not exactly dealing with the most perceptive guy here. But to be fair, Fred did notice, hmm, a few beard-scratching moments along the way. About a year into Otto's attic residency, Fred started getting spooked by some strange sounds. There was one night he was in bed with Dolly, right? When he he swore he heard what sounded like a dude <coughs> clearing his throat. And you just hear like, something wanking in up there. <laughs> you know, just hear like somebody beating off. <laughs> Dolly, though, always quick with his, he's brushed it off, told, told Fred, you're just hearing things, go back to sleep. But Fred was not buying it. He was convinced there was somebody in his house. There was something yeah. strange going on here. He had that feeling. However, Dolly just pulled one out of the old gaslighting playbook, suggested it's probably just a, a pesky rat or a mouse, or that Fred had had one too many drinks. Classic move. Class. You're, you're drunk again. Just I, I, pulling that one. I expect you being in bed and just hear from like, <coughs> what was that? Nah, it's probably a mouse or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're probably right. Yeah. Um, there was one time, so when Dolly and Fred were going out uh, one evening, Dolly, she uh, she left the trap door open. Oh, she she would. She leave the trap door open uh, to to the attic. And then when Otto he heard the front door close, he would scurry downstairs and he'd gorge on like rye bread and cheeses and liverwurst and all that good German food. Yeah, but like Fred, he delicious would. liverwurst. Mm. But uh, Fred, he would often wonder where all the food was going and why he was getting such meager portions of meat when like only yesterday he'd seen a full roast on the dinner table, but Dolly would once again gaslighting him that uh, he'd eaten it the night before when he was piss drunk. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was actually... You fat bastard. <laughs> <laughs> eating all the food. It's like you ate he's it. starving. Yeah. Oh, okay, must have. Yeah. There was one day when Fred was doing a bit of work in the garden and something caught his eye up at the window in the attic. He caught a brief glimpse of what appeared to be a figure before it swiftly disappeared from sight. Which is actually quite, like, creepy. Very creepy, yeah, you know? Yeah. So Fred, he ran inside, shouting to Dolly that someone was in the attic. He knew it. I f someone's in the house. But Dolly urged him to relax, suggesting that he might... He just, he's just overreacting to something he thought he'd seen, and she volunteered to investigate the attic herself. But despite Fred's insistence of going up, Dolly, she persisted, and in truth to form, she got her way. When she came down from the attic, she said in a, a real caring voice, Fred, you've been working too hard at the factory. You're just seeing things. There's mm. nothing up there. Promise me you go to a doctor. Yeah. There's something mentally wrong with you. I know. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're not well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a mouse again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So over time, Fred continued to think he was going mad or even being haunted as he started to see shadows out of the corner of his eye at night and even noticed that some of his cigars were disappearing. Fred did eventually go to see a doctor who at one point said he was likely working at the factory too hard and told him to take it easy. And he also uh, wrote him at a prescription for a tranquilizer to calm him down. This actually had, it was actually really good for Dolly because when he was on these tranquilizers, he was out of it. Completely out of yeah. it. She was up to the attic. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine back in 1922, this tranquilizer was probably just, I don't know, hardcore Academy. drugs. <laughs> yeah, Academy. Yeah, 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 this is like the hardcore shit. Yeah, yeah. Good old days. However, this did not stop Fred's well-justified paranoia, and he decided that they would move out of their Milwaukee home and to Los Angeles. Now, you would think, right? I can hear, I hear your barking big dog as you're listening to this. This would be a perfect chance for Dolly to spill the beans about the affair, to end it, to set Otto free to do his own thing, right? How could, they can't, you know, this can't continue. It's not They're moving across, yeah, it's not sustainable. They're moving across the entire country. Yeah. It was fun while it lasted. Hmm. That was it. Uh, no. <laughs> You'd think that'd be, you'd be wrong. Dolly had no intention of ending things at all. Dolly told Fred she would move to California on one condition. The house must have an attic. 
<laughs> a very peculiar demand, but hey, Fred's thinking, no skin off my sack, if it has an attic or no. Attics are pretty common in houses, so that's not like a big deal. Mm -hmm. After all, as they say, happy wife, happy life. So he found a large, nice home with an attic on North St. Andrew's Place in an affluent part of town. And Otto didn't put up too much of a, hey, listen, California mm. beats Wisconsin. It didn't matter. He was in an attic. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's also true. He does not give a shit. He's yeah. not going to get out anyway. <laughs> so later he would say that he was willing to live cooped up in, an, in, in attics in order to be near the only person in the entire world who cared, which is kind of sweet and very pathetic. Yeah. And so Otto went with them. He made his way out to L.A. and resumed his life of making love to Dolly and doing housework during the day. This then went on for another four years. So uh, uh, that is until the fateful day uh, where we began on the evening of August 22nd, 1922. So yeah, Otto had been living combined in Dolly and Fred Ostrich's attic for nine years in total, almost a decade, yeah. living in, willingly, Willing, living yeah, in, yeah. The, in yeah. the attic. Yeah. As we mentioned at the beginning, on this particular evening, the Ostrikes had just arrived home after a night of partying with friends. They were dancing, they were drinking cocktails, if this was during a prohibition or no, I don't know. They were listening to Ragtime, The Entertainer, all that good stuff. Mm. And they were having a heated argument as they walked through the door, which Otto could hear from his attic well, and he was thinking, uh oh, uh oh, oh, not my, not my beautiful Dolly. <laughs> thinking Fred was attacking Dolly, Otto went down a little hole, which actually led into the bedroom closet, where he found two of Fred's 25 caliber pistols. He grabbed them, dual handed them, because he thought, I'm going to be a badass. This is cool. Yeah. <laughs> I look so fucking cool right now. <laughs> and he went through the kitchen to confront Fred. Fred was, as you can imagine, surprised to find a man in his house, and he tackled Otto and wrestled for the guns. In the struggle, the gun went off. The first bullet hit the ceiling. The next three bullets hit Fred directly in his chest, killing him instantly. The old, it actually went off four times, guy. <laughs> Otto thought they could stage the scene to make it look like burglars had broken in and murdered Fred, panicking and thinking what to do, as people would have heard those gunshots, so they had to act fast. Surprisingly, Otto actually took charge this time, and a scared Dolly followed his lead. Otto removed the diamond-studded chain watch from Fred's body, then locked Dolly in a closet, dropped the key onto the floor before hurrying back upstairs to his little hideout, scurrying away like a little rat. And yes, a neighbor alerted by the gunshots called the cops who arrived promptly. They heard Dolly sobbing from behind the closet door in the couple's bedroom. The key lay on the carpet a few feet away from the door and when the police got Dolly out, she said someone had broken in, shoved her in the chest, shot Fred, and stolen a bunch of valuables, including Fred's diamond watch. Mm. Chief Detective Herman Klein, he was on the scene that night. And when he questioned Dolly, he had some suspicions about what really went down that night, based on the answers Dolly gave, and also the crime scene itself. So when he questioned her, he asked, did you and your husband ever quarrel? To which Dolly replied, never. Even when he pressed, she remained firm that they'd never argued about anything, ever. Klein said he knew she must have been a liar and have something to hide because all couples have the occasional fight. To be honest, I think this kind of says a bit more about Detective Klein's home yeah, life. More yeah. than um, however, he also felt that the crime scene itself was odd. Only one item could be identified as missing, the husband's diamond-studded watch, which you mentioned. But Fred's wallet was still in his pocket and stuffed with cash, which seems like a very odd thing for a burglar to miss when he's robbing the place. Then, after the crime lab determined that Fred Osterreich was killed by a 25 caliber gun, Klein was convinced there was more to Dolly's story than this burglary tale. No burglar uses a 25 caliber gun, he remarked. <laughs> Why, that's a woman's gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no man would use this gun. <laughs> Again, I think this says a bit more about Klein than anything else. But in fairness to him, he was 100% correct with his suspicions. Yeah. So something was up. He's yeah. just going down the wrong path. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Right church, wrong pew, or whatever. <laughs> However, despite all these suspicions, efforts to establish Dolly's guilt were unsuccessful. 
a significant obstacle to accusing her of murdering her husband arose. Simply, it's like that locked room mystery. How could she have locked herself in the closet from the outside? They really just didn't have any evidence to challenge her story, and they had to let her go. Both Dolly and Otto had now gotten away with murder. Now that Fred was no longer around, hey listen, they're free, finally! Mm. After nine years of hiding their beautiful love affair, they were finally free. They can be together. Yes, in the open. Yeah. You know, one might assume Otto would move into the main house, formally be with Dolly. That's not what happened. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Otto chose to remain in the attic. Yeah. I like the attic. <laughs> <laughs> I am the attic. <laughs> <laughs> I have become attic. <laughs> in fact, even after Dolly left the house where her husband was killed, Otto followed her to a new house to live in her new attic. <laughs> he was the attic man now. It's not clear why Otto would choose to stick with the same routine when they no longer needed to. Um, however, Dolly's motive was apparent. See, Dolly, she had aspirations of her own. She started getting involved with a couple of different guys in town. Dolly started seeing a lawyer named Herman S. Shapiro and a guy named Roy Klum. It appears now she was only dating Roy Klum to help her get rid of the murder weapon. She claimed to have a gun similar to the one used by the robber who killed Fred and asked Klum to dispose of it to avoid implicating her in the murder. He tossed it into the La Brea tar pits. Why didn't she just get rid of the gun herself? I, yeah. Like, she could have, like, she didn't need to start a relationship with a guy and, and what, involve another guy. And why did he agree to it? Yeah, this, the, I never understood why she did this. I, w- I wasn't able to confirm, but there was other reports, well, of the other gun. She got her neighbor to bury it in his rosebush. So she was just getting people to do things for her. Yeah. It's like, I'm not doing it. She could easily just get rid of these guns herself where, A, nobody else would know. So yeah, yeah. you're involving more people in your scheme here. Yeah, Because yeah. they know where the guns are. And But, yeah, you could easily just throw... You Go to the Pacific Ocean and throw it in the, like... Yeah, or go down to the tar pit yourself. Yes, exactly. I'm sure yeah. it's like so much shit in that tar pits. Like, yeah, yeah. And as Dolly and Herman Shapiro's relationship blossomed, she surprised him with a diamond watch. The very one she claimed had been stolen by her husband's killer. When Shapiro questioned her about it, she casually mentioned finding it tucked under a couch cushion, dismissing the need to involve the police. He had the killer stole it, and then he just chucked it under a couch and (laughs) ran away. Look what I found. (laughs) Meanwhile, Dolly had successfully used Klum for her purposes and promptly ended things with him. In a spiteful move, however, Roy Klum spilled the beans to the police about the gun he had disposed of in the tar pits for Dolly. This led to Dolly's arrest, based on Klum's account. Despite being in a rather sticky, I see what you did there, (laughs) situation, they managed to fish the gun from the tar pits, and oh, it was in no pretty rough shape. While awaiting her hearing, Dolly told Shapiro about her half-brother who lived in her attic and asked him to bring him groceries. She said all he had to do was tap on the ceiling of the bedroom closet to let him know, and he should come out. So Shapiro went along with Dolly's request to feed her, quote, half-brother. However, after nearly a decade of limited human interaction, the floodgates of confession burst open when Otto finally had somebody to talk to who wasn't Dolly. Shapiro told Otto he should make a run for it, make his way up to Canada while he still could. Just run for your life, boy. Otto, however, was pretty reluctant to do this. But when Shapiro explained that he, him being there could negatively impact Dolly's case, If the police found out he had been living in the murder house the entire time, Otto packed his bags and made his escape to Vancouver, Canada. Otto, finally free, soon found a job working as a porter. He changed his name to Walter Klein and married a Canadian woman. After a time, he did return to Los Angeles with his wife, but we'll get there in a little bit. Meanwhile, in court, Dolly's lawyer moved for a dismissal of the murder charge. No weapon could be connected to the killing. There was no eyewitnesses nor confessions. Reappearance of the stolen watch, though mysterious, was insufficient evidence to support a murder case. And so with that, the judge had no choice but to dismiss the case. There really was no evidence there to charge with murder. Yeah. She had gotten a guy to get rid of her gun for her, mm. which is the same as a murder weapon. But that's not, that's just circumstantial yeah, evidence, yeah. really. It appeared that the killing of Fred Ostreich would remain an unsolved mystery. For now. Mm. Shapiro was apparently not bothered by the murder suspicion or the strange man in the attic. He decided to move in with Dolly, and Shapiro and Dolly enjoyed seven blissful years together. 
However, their romance hit the rocks when they had a falling out over money. So, Herman Shapiro took a page from Roy Klum's playbook and sought revenge by spilling the beans to the cops about Dolly, Otto, and Fred's murder. Dolly found herself once again behind bars, and Otto, who had just returned from his Canadian getaway, was arrested by the LA police. He cannot go ever go to the right place, ever. He's always in the wrong place. That's, like, I, I had no idea why he came out to LA. Yeah. And then I was like, thinking about it, I was like, he doesn't really know anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, he knows yeah. Milwaukee, he knows LA, and he knows Vancouver. Yeah. And I was like, where do I move then? Nah, but back to LA, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. His wife was Canadian. What, if he had just stayed up there, he would have would have been all right. Yeah. Anyway. The media had a frenzy covering the sensational case. Otto earned nicknames like The Batman and The Ghost in the Gart. Otto admitted to the killing, but argued it occurred in a struggle over his guns. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. <laughs> he admitted a killing, but said I was insane when I did. <laughs> his defense played on the... Well, he definitely was insane, let's be honest. It's yeah. supposed to be, yeah. His uh, defense played on the jury's sympathies, portraying him as a pawn in the hands of a much older, sophisticated, and dominant woman. In the courtroom, however, Otto was no longer the fresh-faced teen who had caught Dolly's eye. He was now a sallow, complexion, unremarkable, middle-aged man with a receding hairline, round, black horn-rimmed spectacles, and a nervous twitch, which made him appear pitiable. Mm. In court, Otto, he testified about the nature of their relationship, which really outlined how much power Dolly had over him. He explained that when they had disagreements, he, he would starve himself as a way of protesting. And I, I guess I like, kind of taken back whatever little bit of control he had over his life. He had nothing else. Like This is yeah. the only thing that he could control. When he wouldn't eat anything, he would stay up in the attic space and only come down when he was needed for chores, but not for anything else. Yeah. Wink, wink. <laughs> Eventually, Dolly, she'd feel sorry for him and would leave food outside the trap door uh, as a gesture of goodwill. But eventually, she would become annoyed at him, at which point Otto would say that he'd have to behave himself. When the lawyer asked, did that have anything to do with sex? Otto replied, yes, sir, as a rule. <laughs> so, man, she's like a succubus. <laughs> yeah, she really is just sucking the very life energy out of him. The jury had sympathy after hearing how Dolly kept him locked up since he was a 17-year-old boy, essentially taking away any chance he ever had to have a normal life. In the end, the jury did not convict him of murder, but did find him guilty of manslaughter. But luck was on his side. The statute of limitations for manslaughter was seven years, and it had now surpassed eight years. He strolled out as a free man. Otto resumed his writing endeavors, and to everyone's knowledge, he did not resort to attic living anywhere else. Dolly's trial resulted in a hung jury, and the charges were eventually dismissed in 1936. She found another companion, and they lived together peacefully until her passing in 1961, at the age of 80. Ironically, living over a garage in a run-down section of LA. So she spent her final years living in a sort of an attic. Mm. And with that ends the bizarre story of Dolly the Naughty Vamp and Otto San Huber the Batman. Oh, nice. Wild story. There, yeah. there, there was a movie written about it in 1995 called The Man in the Attic. The names, they were changed for the movie, but Neil Patrick Harris, he played who Otto would have been, and Anne Archer, who's Barbara in It's Always Sunny. Which one's Barbara in Always Sunny? Uh, Dennis's mum. Oh, she uh, even in It's Always Sunny, she kind of plays a similar character yeah, to Dolly, right. actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, can, you can really see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she played who Dolly would have been, uh, the older woman who hides her younger lover in the attic of the house for years without her husband suspecting. Ah. Yeah. But another silver lining, I guess, to this for Otto. So as bad as living in the attic for Otto would have been, uh, the United States they'd entered World War One in 1917, and he likely would have been drafted if not for hiding away wow. in a sex crazed ladies' attic. Um, so yeah, silver linings and all that. Well, hey, yes, uh, yeah, he could have been killed in the trenches if not for Dolly. So yeah, listen, you gotta thank her for something. Look, it's either Flanders or the attic. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. There's no yeah, in between. I'll, I'll choose the attic. <laughs> uh, I actually want to before we end this whole episode, I gotta thank a podcast listener who emailed me before we were covering this so they had no idea we we're actually going to cover this story their name is essie and they 
somebody emailed me a story, uh, just sent me an email with a short blurb of Alabama's discount Dolly Ostrike, which is very interesting because they sent me this email a couple of days ago. No way. Okay. Before we we're recording yeah. this one. Um, so I don't have the full story here, so I'm just going to give the cliff notes. But okay. this happened very recently uh, in... Uh, I'm actually reading news reports here in front of me, so I'm not going to do a great job of covering this. But this happened just in 2021 mm-hmm. in Alabama. So this is a... It's like the Ostrich story only. There's a lot of meth involved. Um, there was Frank and his wife, Tracy. Frank Reeves and his wife, Tracy. Okay, I'm gonna let me read you out just a couple of sections of okay, these okay, news yeah, reports. Yeah. So an Alabama man was shot in the chest and injured in a gunfight with his wife's lover, who had secretly been living in their home for over a year. So very similar to the Ostrich story of Fred, Dolly, and Otto, only it was Frank, his wife Tracy, and then her lover, Michael Amaker, or Amaker, uh, and they were all high on meth. Oh, okay. And Michael, <laughs> it turns out, had been living in Frank and Tracy's home for over a year. But again, it seems that Frank, the husband, never noticed because he was high on meth. Right. Yeah. And then uh, he was able to keep his uh, presence in the home a secret because Tracy provided him with food when he needed it. He also stayed hidden by urinating in bottles, limiting his trips to the bathroom. Uh, police actually later found bottles of urine in a room where he had been, uh, where he had been living. And it seems that what happened here is that um, Tracy, again, the, all these reports are kind of very vague because the police, when they went to the scene of this house in Alabama, they're all so high on meth. Everybody was basically incoherent, quote, too intoxicated and incoherent to be interviewed at the scene. But it appears something like this, that Tracy, she told her boyfriend that her husband was an intruder. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So it was a murder for hire of getting her boyfriend to kill the husband who lived in the house the entire time. Right, okay. This makes no sense. Um, yeah. Meth has, man. Here's what the uh, Mobile County Sheriff's Captain Paul Birch had to say. People that are on meth, you really can't apply a normal rationale to their thought process, so you always have to take that into account as well. Not only do they have paranoia, they can't keep their mouth shut. So if there was some kind of a diabolical plan, it is very possible... Michael Amaker, who is the live-in boyfriend, has told some other people. He also said this is one of the most bizarre cases he's ever seen. I've still yet to figure out how somebody can be staying in your house and you do not know it. It's something I haven't seen in 30 plus years. Apparently this Michael Amaker is well known in the meth community. He's been arrested multiple times. Uh, They've all been arrested. Uh, So the husband and the boyfriend shot each other, but it seems they both uh, have survived. If you look at pictures of them, they... Do you know um, Breaking Bad, the meth yeah. characters? They, yeah, yeah. The character actors, as what they call them. Right. Uh, they all look like them. Okay. And most recently, which was in September of Just Gone, uh, an arrest warrant has been issued for Michael Amaker because he fled. He failed to show up to trial. Right, right. So there you have it. It's kind of similar to the Australian yeah, one. Only yeah. imagine they're all on meth yeah. and they're all redneck trailer trash whatever these people are it's like the updated version like if they're kind of yeah re- modern version if they're like yeah they're re- redo the movies type thing in yeah mo- in modern day you know yeah so uh here's what happened on the night of the shooting reeves husband frank was loading the car ahead of a planned trip to the beach then tracy ran out of the house saying there was an intruder then her husband frank reeves ran into the house and michael amaker and frank reeves shot each other and injured each other so <laughs> This is, I, as, as the, the sheriff even said, this makes no sense. I just really like the idea that the meth heads are still planning trips to the beach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, it was, sun's out, guns out. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You gotta still have fun. Like. So this Tracy woman was hiding her husband, or her boyfriend, Michael Amaker, in the house. He was pissing in bottles, yep. which is a little, I mean, I think even Otto had it better than that. Uh, he had a piss bottle. Yeah. yeah. And then Frank was outside. Her husband was outside packing up the car. She went inside, told her boyfriend, there's an intruder mm. coming into the house. She ran outside, told her husband, there's an intruder already in the house. Mm. They ran inside and shot each other, thinking the other was the intruder. Right. Yep. The, hey, listen, yeah. meth, not even once. Yeah. <laughs> but there you have it, Shanae, folks. Thank you so much for listening to me and Keith. I hope you enjoyed this whole episode of the That Chapter podcast. Uh, that was good. I enjoyed that one. Pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. yeah. All right, Keith, uh, give us your final thoughts as, uh, you know, we'd like you to do. Uh, I guess all this talk men in the attic. I think I might go home and check my own attic. Good. Oh, spooky attic. You have the horror. You don't have a man. You have a ghost in the attic. 
Man goes maybe. I, I hope it's not a man. If it is a man, I need to have some stern words because Otto was at least clean the place. Yeah, he was at least doing something. I have still dirty. Yeah, yeah making gin in the bathroom. So. <laughs> have you actually had any ghost encounters? Encounters of the ghostly attic no, kind no, lately? Yet. No, nothing yet. Chilled out. No, nothing noteworthy on me. Like, yeah. still like the bumps in the night, but like, nothing like, yeah, nothing to write home about. Yeah. Well, yeah. Too bad. I know. Well, let's hope the ghost gets his act together and starts scaring you again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. To the next one. See ya. Thanks. See, funnily enough, by the way, Fred, German immigrant, his surname Ostreich means Austria. Huh? Oh. So which is it, Fred, you piece of <laughs> shit? <laughs> Get your story straight. Yeah, do you think, we, should we go uh, all uh, Elliot Stabler on the characters in our stories <laughs> from now on? It's like, you fucking animal, which is it? It's like, start beating him around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were well, talking about this the other day, SVU rules. Oh man, Stabler, he's just... He's so unstable. Oh, I love unstable it. He's stabler. like, the things he does to the suspects at SVU is like, he should have been fired. Yeah. Long, he beats them up regularly. <laughs> yeah. He lies yeah. to them. He blackmails them. Yeah. And these half time, they're innocent people. Yeah, like, we were talking about it last week, and there was one scene where he was coming, he was interrogating someone, he was like, I'm going to rip your cherry ass apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's not okay, yeah. sir. <laughs> He's like, Shout, are you fucking piece of shit? Like, slamming him into the wall. I thought he was, he was, he was even guilty in the uh, end. <laughs> he, he rocks. <laughs>